Hi everyone, it's Ren here. Welcome to my room, guys. I hope you're well today. Today we're going to take another question from uh, my Patreon supporters. It's a question that relates to the relationship between Enneagram and the theory of types, MBTI, Myers-Briggs, Jung, and all that. And what is the overlap? How can we make that work together? Because it sometimes seems as if it's not so obvious uh, how we can do that. But before I move on to my topic, there's the obligatory thing that you know what I'm going to do. And I even forgot to put them next to me, as I always do. But don't forget that I've written two books. My new novel, The Infinite Castle, The Exotic Soul, my book on the INFJ, both available at the links below. Thank you for your support. Check them out, see the reviews, and see if that might interest you. INFJ, INFJ is interested in MBTI. Actually, that's another, um, that's another question that... Uh, that I, I, I was asked to tackle at some point, and I will, you know, uh, that is to say, are INFJs uniquely suited to have a pronounced interest in, in, in MBTI? Um, as in, you know, is there a particular connection? We know that the originator of the theory, not MBTI, but the psychology of types, Jung himself was INFJ, but um, it's a question that's worth asking, you know, whether that goes further than that. Um, now, in relation to uh, the theory of types and Enneagram, that's a very good question because, first of all, there tends to be sometimes in the community um, a view, which I see floated about quite a bit, um, according to which the Enneagram is something that's, you know, you shouldn't take too seriously. It's kind of woo stuff. It's kind of funny, but it's kind of like astrology. Um, there's no reason to take it as any more seriously than that, any more than just a kind of pastime that um, you can engage in frivolously. It ought not to be uh, attributed any kind of intellectual or even less scientific respectability. So the, th the, the, the thing, I, I, so I think that that opinion is wrong. I think that that's, uh, this is missing the point of Enneagram in a sense, but in fact, not just missing the point of Enneagram, it's also missing the point of the theory of types in general. Um, because the irony of this position, for those who hold this position, is that it seems that in that kind of moment of time, in that second, isolated second, the people who express the views forget that that's exactly the, the kind of position that the so-called scientific critics of uh, the theory of types um, express about the theory of types, that it's not to be taken seriously, that it's woo-woo, that it's astrology, that it's uh, completely pseudoscientific and of no interest. Um, so in a way, it's shooting yourself in the foot to say, well, the sciency, like the super and austerely sciency people are wrong, um, the theory of types is valuable, even if it's not scientific in the same way that, say, like the <laughs> atomic physics is scientific. Um, but, you know, Enneagram, that, that's, that is what. Uh, we, we're not going to go there. That's too far. That's too spiritual woo-woo stuff. Um, so in a way, this position is not very surprising from a psychological viewpoint, because often you defend yourself against an accusation by demarcating a territory vis-a-vis what you're not, you know, so you're, you'll defend yourself saying, no, no, we ought to be taken seriously because we're not like this other thing. So Enneagram tends to be lumped in there by some people, by not in, far from everyone. You know, there's a lot of people who have an interest in um, the theory of types that uh, also have an interest in Enneagram. Like, there's loads of people. It's not, a, it's not like a small minority, but there are, there's, there's a sizable number of people that don't. And so for these people particularly, because I think that, those who already are using the two systems are doing it intuitively. They don't necessarily maybe need a how-to guide as to how to make it work, how to let those two spaces uh, inhabit this, the same broader region and, and, and dwell in that region with each other and, and reinforce each other. Um, but then there's those people that don't understand, are not sure how to do this, and they think maybe, so either Enneagram is too vague, is too fluffy, things like that, or maybe they just think, well, it's just a competing theory. 
it's making different claims. And since besides that, it's vaguer and more sort of nebulous, we might stick, stick to the theory of types. Um, so one way to approach this practical question, this question in a practical fashion, is to point the over, point at the overlap between the two systems. Um, and there is quite a significant number of overlap. The first thing to mention is that the theory of types and the inner gap don't actually measure the same things in people. They're both typologies in a sense. You know, uh, the theory of types will assign you one of 16 types um, and potentially a higher level of granularity than 16, much higher level, you know, for some theories. Um, but say the basic sort of baseline is 16 types. Uh, and your gram assigns you nine types. Right, then you can again make it more, much more complicated because you can go up to 27 with tri types, uh, and it's uh, and that's not even counting like the instinctual, the instincts, you know, sexual instinct, self preservation instinct, social instinct. So, Enneagram is actually also very detailed at some level, it, it can provide a lot of detail. In fact, it can provide the kind of detail that the theory of type doesn't provide because it's not within the remit of the theory of types. In some sense, the, 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 the porousness and nebulosity and sort of mushiness of an Enneagram is a direct corollary of its descriptive vibrancy and richness. You have so much descriptive vibrancy in an Enneagram that it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to get it properly systematized. And since you cannot get it properly systematized, uh, certain categories will just tend to sometimes blend into each other and you get you, you get some vagueness. You, you can, you know, like sometimes, I mean, some typical examples are when, you know, someone is a, is a type six or someone is a cantophobic and then they're social or they're sexual or are they an eight? Are they a, a self-preservation eight? But it's really not, it's a six. And there can be lots of complications and it's, but it has that great descriptive value, okay? Now, the theory of types, on the other hand, it does have some descriptive value, but it's a main, um, our, it's, it's main strength, or at least what it proclaims to be a strength, is to actually be, be systematic. So it's, you know, it's more or less says, okay, so if you are an INFJ type or if you're an INFP type, you have that set of different functions. These functions, I mean, are given uh, descriptions, of course, but they're not just descriptions. Like they are positive to actually exist in your psyche. Whereas in the case of Enneagram, it's not like you have a oneness or a sevenness or a tri-type that is in your psyche. Here we're really dealing, in the case of Enneagram, with a description of what's going on a bit more generally at the level of your personality, at the level of your inclinations, at the level of your preferences, at the level of your reactions. And I would say perhaps at a more existential level than, than the theory of types. Um, and there's a, as, you, as you know, there's a very prominent role uh, in the Enneagram linked to the emotions, which is really interesting because that part is somewhat missing from the theory of types. In the theory of types, you can look at it and realize, well, it's pretty agnostic as, re as, re as relates to the particular quality of the emotional ecosystem of, of each and individual person. There's no positing that a T, that, you know, that a T dominant is less emotional than an FI dominant or an FE dominant. Some biases and preconceptions and, and, and wrong judgments might be made, but in fact, it, it's pretty agnostic in relation to that. Whereas an Enneagram, it's, it won't say, tell you a, a nine is more emotional than a seven or a six is, but we know, for example, that a six is an attachment type, that a one is a rejection, uh, frustration type, sorry. One is a rejection type, so they, uh, ah, I keep getting mixed up, frustration type. So emotional frustration will be part of the ad attitudinal and behavioral motivation of a type one. Sounds vague, but useful. It says something, you know, that's that's the point of Enneagram. And uh, with the Enneagram six, it's a very useful way to distinguish them from the Enneagram five is five is a rejection type. So approaches relationships first from the point of view of rejection, whereas six is an attachment type. So it approaches relationships first from the point of view of attachment. Both might be they're intellectual types, hard to distinguish in so far as you're looking at the intellectual products, cognitive products they, they, they share with others, but in terms of their emotional relationship with other people and the broader community, one starts from the point of view of rejection, you know, being protected. The other starts from the 
point of view of attachments needing to be connected. And, and from, from that follows a lot of the six-ish traits, you know, such as uh, feeling anxious that you're not actually properly connected and doing what you should be doing. Um, whereas the five is much more self-contained. So you have all this domain of somewhat vague, but at the same time still descriptively useful emotional sphere that you will not find in the theory of types. And those can be connected because if you're an INFJ1, well, in addition to the usual you know, makeup of your MI, FE, TI, SE, you're going to, at that level, besides others, but if we just zero in at that level, the your emotional, the form of your emotionality and how you manifest it to the world, it's going to be very different from if you're an INFJ type 5 or an INFJ type 9 with the tendency to merge, tendency to be in a state of flow, and tendency to be an attachment type, just like the 6. If you're an INFJ type Two, that's again very different, and energy type four, that's again very different. Um, so again, the description, the descriptive richness is enriched. So it's not true that the enneagram, in a way, is competing with the theory of types because the enneagram doesn't really make any posits, doesn't commit to the existence of these forms in the mind. If it did commit to these, then we'd be asking ourselves, okay, do we have the cognitive functions and I, F, E, and company? Or do we have these Enneagram forms? They'd be competing in this case. But in, in reality, they're not competing because, yes, the types posits these forms, these structures in our psyche, cognitive functions particularly. Enneagram is more a very useful vocabulary to enrich what we have in the conceptual scheme of MBTI to add layers of complexity and high resolution when it comes to attachment emotion, disposition, which is why I think that thinking about it in terms of existentials, in terms of the existential constitution of a person is very useful. Because, for example, in the ecstatic soul, I provide, you know, an existential analysis of the INFJ type when I talk about alienation, basic existential, basic feature of the existential constitution, the INFJ. Uh, you know, uh, another one is prescience, or, you know, that's, prescience is the, the, the enlightened form. But you have you have alienation. You have um, you have um, oh I'm not forgetting. It's not it's it's not uh, fuzziness. But you know you remember the second existential trait is not fuzziness. It's oh I should remember this. I came up with that concept. But anyway, let's say fuzziness, and then there's uh, again uh, world belonging and so on. So all these are kind of existential traits. You can look, you can analyze the MBTI system in terms of providing some existential features of our constitution, and then take what you what you can from the Enneagram and add some existential features. For example, in the INFJ1, you could probably add a certain relationship to morality or to virtue. In the case of the INFJ6, you probably add some something relative to anxiety and belonging, and you can apply that to all the types. So if you think about both theories in terms of each providing a certain set of words, a certain set of verbs, a vocabulary, which you can then think about bringing together, what you get is an enrichment of the possibility of describing your personality and the personality of others. And by doing this and throughout doing this, you haven't really cared about whether one is better than the other or one is more true than the other. Because in some sense, there's a lot of intellectual masturbation that comes with that, you know? And wanting to be right and wanting to have the best theory. I mean, if the, po the, the, the main reason for someone embracing a theory is that they want it to be more right than others and they can be happy with possess possessing that theory, they make it something egocentric in a way and it's kind of juvenile, you know. If our purpose when we're exploring these personality systems, we say like it's, it doesn't have the scientificity of a physical theory exactly, but it's providing a very useful vocabulary to understand ourselves better and others better and make use of that. And you kind of lose a bit of interest in having these kind of big controversial debates with others saying my system is better than system. Let's look at just how useful they are in terms of the vocabularies they provide and how well articulated those vocabularies are. Let me know what you think in the comments, guys, and I will see you tomorrow. Don't forget that if you want to suggest some topics to me, my Patreon page is down below. Join the community. Bye-bye.